Welcome back. This time we're talking about the third episode of D Discovery Channel's new scripted series, Manhunt Unabomber. The first two episodes were shown back to back as a single two hour show and managed to hook me from the very first minutes. Um, thanks to two very strong performances from Sam Worthington and Paul Bettany. This episode is entitled Fruit of the Poisonous Tree and we learn very quickly why that is so. And now before I get much further into this episode, unlike my review of the first episode, I will be getting into spoiler territory in this review. So if you haven't seen this episode yet, I recommend pausing this video, go watch the episode, and then come back and listen to my thoughts and comment on your thoughts about the episode. So with that warning out of the way, let's dive into this. As I said, the meaning of the episode title is revealed very quickly. Um, we start the episode in 1997 with Fitz returning to the interrogation room to talk to Ted Kaczynski. And he continues trying to connect with him. And seemingly is doing a very good job of that until Ted turns the entire conversation around showing that he is actually going to use Fitz to get himself off of these charges by discrediting him and the science that he used to secure a search warrant that ultimately gathered all of the evidence that will be used against Ted if he were to go to trial. And it's at this point that we jump back to 1995 and see just how Fitz and his various partners work together to create essentially a new branch of forensics, forensic linguistics trying to find clues in the Unabomber's manifesto and other letters to find a way to narrow down their profile. And for the most part, they're kind of spinning their wheels because they're inventing this as they go and they don't always know what's actually a clue and what's not. And it's not until Fitz invites a bunch of college professors to a meeting that he finally gets some headway th with the help of a comparative linguistics professor named Natalie. And I didn't realize until later when we jump back to 1997 that this is the same Natalie whose couch Fitz is crashing on since he is no longer connected with his family. And we still don't know exactly what happens between the two time periods to basically destroy his family life. We know he's not living with his family more and that he's basically been living isolated in a cabin for an extended period of time before he's brought in to interrogate Ted. We also see that in 1995, at least at this point, his wife is still calling him late at night and they're having talks. But we do get a possible clue when Natalie is talking to Fitz in 1997, talking about the work that they did together and how it was solid and she makes a comment essentially along the lines of no matter what else we had, the work was right. So, implying that they may have some kind of illicit relationship moving forward in this episode. I don't know that's complete speculation at this point. Um, but that's pretty much what we know as far as any kind of clue to what may have happened to his family life aside from just his obsession with the case. But it's with Natalie's help that he's able to put an age range to the Unabomber's profile. So when he is asked to present his findings and they seem to lead to a suspect that his superiors have already identified, he objects when it turns out that this suspect is too young and he's not willing to let his superiors um, chase down what he believes is a wild goose chase. And it's this insubordination, very vocal and public insubordination that essentially costs, costs him his team and puts him back in the doghouse that he had finally gotten himself out of with his work on the uh, manifesto, as well as the letter threatening the airline. And it's through this almost public shaming and complete unwillingness of his superiors to take his ideas seriously that we really begin to see the parallels between Fitz and the Unabomber um, that were more alluded to in the previous episode. Now, his superiors not listening to him is not necessarily um, inexcusable because he is literally creating a new science and they really don't have a reason to say, oh, this is something completely new, but let's, let's ignore everything else that we've been working on and go with this. 
Um, they've already sort of boxed these characters into a corner, having been so unwilling to listen to him early on. And we also know that Fitz is essentially proven correct. What we don't know yet is whether his analysis that was used for the search warrant is actually going to hold up in court, or is it going to all be thrown out and Ted Kaczynski to walk free? But the fact that this tension is still there shows that the writers have done a really good job of balancing these two timelines so that the 1997 timeline does not completely ruin the suspense of the 1995 one. And actually both really do a good job of playing off of the other and helping to sustain each other's tension. Once again, we get really great performances from Worthington and Bettany. And I can see why they combine the first two episodes for this initial run, because we really get very little of Ted, especially in what is essentially the first episode, and we don't really get to meet him until the second, and not for very long. It's in this episode that his intellect really gets to shine, where you can see that he has spent this entire first interrogation um, boxing him into the corner. And then when Fitz goes back and we feel like, okay, this is where Fitz is going to regain the momentum, and we see that Ted is able to turn the screws on him again, talking about legacies, especially after Fitz says that his legacy is his family, and Ted gets to dig in about that how he has abandoned him, something that he learned from Fitz's own words. So this series continues to be very fascinating. I essentially know how it's going to ultimately end, at least for Ted. I have no, know nothing about Fitz's character and how, how accurate or grounded in reality his character is. I have refused to really do much in the way of research or reading about this because I want to be surprised. I'll find out after the show is over, and I'll probably include some analysis of it in, the, in a review of the final episode. But for now, I really don't want to spoil myself, so I'm just going in blind and having a good time watching this show. So with that, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about this episode. Um, another example of good writing and good performances. Now, if you saw this episode, what did you think about it? And how do you like the way they are playing the two timelines off of each other? Um, is it working for you as well as it's been working for me? As always, you can subscribe to my channel, check out some of my other reviews, and until next time, choose your style guides carefully.